What's up, guys? This is Keith Kelfus with the Untrapped Podcast. And on this YouTube Live, this is my first time going live during the Untrapped Podcast. So I'm kind of testing right now. But anyways, I want to talk about being self-employed, owning a small business, a landscaping business, window cleaning, whatever you're doing, and being married or being engaged or having a serious relationship where you have a home life and then you have your business life. A lot different, we all know, than clocking in and out of a job, a nine to five, because you bring your home work, your 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 work home with you, you have paperwork at home, and you have a lot of things going on. So therefore you can be at work and you're thinking about home. You're at home and you're thinking about work. Primarily if you're married, I want to talk about some of the stuff that you can go through from personal experience and stuff that I've gone through in the past that has taken years to kind of iron out the kinks. And so by chance, if you are incredibly busy, which I hope you are, it being now June, if you have a landscaping or lawn care business, you know what it's like to be swamped. This type of time of year is incredibly hectic. What's that? Fly, uh, Fionn Thompson, Motorcycle Mayhem, Tony Newburn. Can anybody hear me? Can you hear me good? Life and Wealth Goals, Jonathan Graham, Semper Fi Lawn Care, SGB Landscaping. Yeah, can you hear me? Good. What's up, Angela Carlton and Nathan Lawn? So this type time of year is crazy. Anything that is not ha- that doesn't have to do with um, work and business just kind of piles up and you have to set it to the side until you can get back to it because this is a money-making time. It's grind time. This is also the time that uh, relationships can get really stressed out or if you're married because you're not spending enough time at home, you're not spending the time. um, Most of my audience is men. So I'll say you're not spending the most, most time with your, your, your wife, right? If you're, a woman business owner. Either way, it, it goes. I remember a time in 2016, I came home. I uh, was working. I'm a workaholic. Any workaholics here? Literally like 90 hours. My wife was standing out in the driveway. She was leaving. She was upset. I come home, a million things on my plate. And she says she wants a divorce and she wants to go back uh, and go stay at her mom's house for a while. And she was serious, right? It hurt really, really bad. Um, so I was trying to talk to her. She didn't want to talk. She was done, right? You know that feeling. It's a horrible feeling when you're trying to do it and you have this BS excuse where you're saying that, well, but I'm doing this for us, right? And that's what I want to break down and get into. Another time, I remember, I don't know, there was quite a few times in my marriage where where uh, my wife has said stuff like, I'm, I'm done with this crap. You know, I've heard her on the phone crying with her mom saying, um, you know, I didn't sign up for this. Right. I remember a time my wife and I were arguing in the kitchen and uh, she's like, I didn't sign up for this. When I married you, I didn't know that you were going to be working literally constantly. That's all you do is work. Right. And then you have uh, family members that can you feel like they're ganging up on you, telling you that you need to take time off work. But. I had this analogy in my hand. It's almost like you can you can feel like you're alone. And that's the worst place to be is to feel like you're the you're the only person who knows what you're going through. Like you're trying to like there's there's wolves trying to break into your house and eat your family and you're running around putting uh boards and you're nailing up boards all over the windows and doors to protect your house frantically. And then like you feel like your family is running around with pry bars ripping the boards off while you're putting the boards up. And then you're fighting over it. But I think this is all a big, uh, an illusion because what your woman really wants is she wants to know in her heart of hearts that you are doing this all for the both of you or for your family. And that if everything went to hell in, in a handbasket, you would pick her. She wants to know at the deepest level that you would always put her first before anything, before your business, before your clients, before anything. If everything fell apart, that the only thing that would be left standing is you and her. And if your woman doesn't feel, feels the key word, and she knows that she knows that she's your everything, then she'll do anything 
um, to, to get your attention, even if it's something negative, like, like starting an argument. And, and, and a lot of times I'm speaking from a man's perspective, a man will put his head in the sand and then just go work harder and make up excuses. Uh, and then it's, it's, it's a, it's a state of consciousness, which is selfish. I mean, my, and we start making the people that we love like an enemy, like they don't understand or she doesn't understand why I'm doing all this. So we can use work as the perfect excuse. Um, I'm, I'm 36 now. I have friends that have gotten divorced and I talk to them. I have in-depth conversations, learning and inquiring why. And I think that you can sense like the dichotomy and the consciousness of what's truth and what's false, what's an excuse and what's not. And a lot of times we believe that our excuses are true. So it, it literally took a good five years in my marriage. I mean, I've been married for, I've been with this woman for like nine years now, nine years. And it took a long, long, long time until the connection inside of me happened of, of unity. So I'm not trying to preach to you uh, what to believe, but like God first, then, then family, you know, then wife, then business, then yourself. And I think that when you try to do it any other way, it's unsustainable and it falls apart. So it's kind of like if she really knows that you're there for her no matter what and you have her back then she'll let you go out and be a workaholic she'll let you do whatever you have to do to bring home the bacon or whatever you want to call it um because she trusts you now so does that make sense married 15 years lisa allen god is definitely first beautiful congratulations Keith, never reward bad behavior from a partner. Alpha interactions. That makes sense. Ooh, that's a good, good, good thing right there. Oh, yeah. I want to say this uh, episode right here on Untrapped Podcast. And also, you can listen to this on any podcast platform. So if you like to listen and you can't watch video, you can listen to my podcast on SoundCloud, Libsyn, any podcast platform, iTunes. Go to KeithKelfus.com, go over to the podcast tab, and you can pick your favorite platform. And then you can listen to this as plenty as many other op episodes. And this is brought to you by House Call Pro. House Call Pro is an app. It's a software that you can run your entire service business off of. You can send estimates, quotes. You can communicate with your customers by the click of a button and it'll let them know through email and text response that you're on, your crew is on the way or the crew is on the way. Um, you can follow up with them. Um, email autoresponder sequences, reviews. You can collect money through the app. It's an amazing app. House Call Pro is one of the most trusted brands in the entire service industry for efficiency and just running your business it's it's a beautiful app so check out house call pro and you can get the first month for only 19 dollars through my link at housecallpro.com forward slash keith k i'll put a link in the description below this video if you want to check out house call pro all right so i really like what you're saying lisa about One second here. Wow, there's a lot of comments coming in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Alpha interactions. Keith, never reward bad behavior uh, from a partner. <sighs> okay, so if anybody has read the book, The Way of the Superior Man by David Data, there's books about consciousness and enlightenment in relationships from Eckhart Tolle to the five love languages to men are from Mars, women are from Venus. So the, the first stage masculinity is I, me, my, my way or the highway. Uh, the second stage relationship is functionality and fairness. And then the third stage relationship is where love wins no matter what. You'll bend over backwards for your partner and do things for them without expecting anything in return. This is a conscious form of relationship where, where love wins, right? But from the first stage lens perspective, the third stage can look like the first stage. What I mean by, what I mean by that is 
maybe you have an health, a healthy argument or debate with your spouse to, to get to something. Different people communicate in different ways. But from the immature perspective, it looks like neglect or abuse or it looks like something that you don't understand what it is. But it's highly functional coming from the 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 enlightened perspective now what what we can do as men is it's called going along to get along right uh, there are these dynamics in relationship where there's a depolarization and the shift of masculine feminine consciousness and a man can develop a feminized shell that is primarily if he has a masculine core right because some men have a feminine core some women have a masculine core and this whole depolarization there's there's that's a different conversation, but I'll just keep it traditional. Uh, a man can develop a feminized shell, and then the woman who's the reciprocal can develop a masculinized shell. So what happens is there's a codependency in the relationship, and then the shells will bump off of each other and cause these dynamic patterns of uh, unnecessary suffering, right? Because maybe the man isn't being true to his core, the woman isn't being true to her core, so she will she'll develop a masculinized shell because the man isn't being the man. Uh, and I'm talking not, I'm not talking about a first stage, um, uh, kind of caveman, man, selfish man. I'm talking about a man who, uh, communicates from his heart and he always stays connected, uh, no matter what the chaos and the environment is. If you go back, you know, say thousands of years and think of traditionally, <laughs> man, I, I gotta watch what I'm saying here. There are dynamics in a relationship where a man feels like a victim. He feels like his his woman is always bossing him around, telling him what to do, and she's acting like his mother. And he's calling her in his head, making up stories, calling her a, a B, the B word, and he doesn't even want to come home anymore. So now he goes and buries himself in, in work because he doesn't want to come home to his woman who is griping and always complaining and yelling at him and things like that, right? And that might seem very real. So when the man tries to, uh, he he'll get advice from his other male friends or other male business owners. Well, you have to. Well, you got to be the man in your household. You got to be the man. So he'll he'll develop this false sense of uh, alpha male, and he'll start being a man who's only a man sometimes, but he's doing it because he's acting and playing out a role, trying to be the man. And this isn't better than anything. This is a reciprocal energy. And this is the yin yang of, of, of masculine and feminine to make kind of a relationship work. So it's a, it's a dance moment by moment. So he'll, what he'll do is out of insecurity, he'll comp he'll overcompensate and start trying to play a role. And then it just triggers, it just triggers fights because the woman will not trust him, the integrity of that and she'll test that integrity right so if he is the spine of her surrender or he's supposed to be and then she'll crash feminine energy against him to test and back test that integrity if he collapses under the pressure then he was a liar all along right and now he's actually losing ground with his wife and getting into this position where now he's resenting her or vice versa right so it takes a long time to build up this emotional bank account, you know, while in the midst of all the chaos of everyday ordinary life and developing healthy boundaries in your home of what you tolerate and what you put up with from other people. But it takes a long time to build up this emotional bank account where, where they trust each other over time. And whenever anything tries to impose itself into the relationship, whether it's from without or within that, um, the love and the trust wins and it'll, it'll be really hard. It'll feel like you're being stretched out and squeezed through the cracks and there can be a lot of suffering while building this, this, this foundation of conscious love in a relationship. And it'll, it'll feel um, like you guys are suffering while you're building this foundation. And if you mess up, let's say from the man one time, if he's be being out of integrity with this woman, then what it'll do is it'll it'll mess up and it'll destroy everything you've built along the way. So it can feel you can get into a state of discouragement. And this is where people start talking about throwing the divorce word around. And um, that's a very painful word. And sometimes when we get upset, we we throw around words that we really don't mean. So then 
once you start working, doing the self work, say as a, as a man who's self-employed and working on your own state of consciousness and becoming calibrated with what's true and what's not, <laughs> you can start to, um, have discernment when you, when, when your, your woman is upset between what she really means when she's saying it or what she just means right now because she's upset and wants to get your attention because on the highest level, she really just wants to feel um, the level of connection and love that never, it never dies no matter what. Like I said in the beginning that if everything fell apart, it would, you would, you would still have her back no matter what. So if your woman feels like if, if you get under pressure, you're going to throw her under the bus or one day throw her under the bus. It's not the 99% of you that claims that you love her so much. It's the 1% that's driving her crazy. So she can feel that 1%. If you're concealing or you're hiding or you have any psychological back doors in your consciousness, it could be something way far down. That's just a little back door. You feel you're going to run. If anything ever hits, the, oh, you're going to run. Are you that dude who's you're saving up? You're saving. Oh, you're saving up because because one day when it hits the fan, you're gonna like. Uh, she can feel that women uh, emotionally are brilliant and they can feel everything like magnitude uh, amplified times a hundred, right? So you can't conceal or hide anything. It's only when you get to the point where you're completely wide open and you walk in your own death. I'm really nervous talking about this right now. <sighs> when you're fully present and conscious. And you can divorce yourself from the chaos. And it doesn't matter what crashes against you. You don't collapse. Especially when you're present with her. When she can feel that and she tests it, um, she'll, she'll, she'll turn it up, you know, from a three to a four to a five and you think you got it. Uh, -uh. she's going to turn that energy up to a 10 and crash it against you to try to get you to collapse. Like, a, you know, that's like, uh, so then she's right that you are a flake of a man. You can't handle the pressure. You can't be there to raise a family and, and have her and hold her and love her until death do you part. Right. And, and, and if you collapse, then you are a, you're a faker, you're a charlatan, you're a man that would eventually leave her one day or cheat on her or, um, do things to destroy your family, right? Because you're, you're a flake. And this is what this kind of like wake up warrior week stuff is where, you know, so Basically, if she, you have to be willing, uh, a, a truly conscious man knows that everything he builds will eventually collapse and crumble. He knows that he'll eventually die. He knows that the greatest thing that he can do with his life is to give it away. The unconscious man is selfish and obsessed with his short-term gains and goals and would eventually throw anybody under the bus, including his own family, in order to get what he wants, right? And I think the hardest thing to do is to let go and be a servant and and to love and to serve and to give without expecting anything in return because you're operating from your heart. And what it does is it takes a shedding of the old self and, and it feels like you're being ripped apart and like you're dying like like a, a caterpillar is in a cocoon and, it, and it, it evolves into a butterfly. Well, it's a death. It's an ego death. And, and as you die, you're being reborn into a new self and you're rising up in consciousness to what could be called the statesman. If you can't lead yourself, how can you lead a family? And if you can't lead a family, you know, how can you lead... A small business and if you can't lead a small business how can you lead a community or a town or an organization and how can you be the leader of your life or, or of anything if you can't find those unconscious parts of yourself and squash them or, or dissolve them you know 
this type of self-work that starts with self-love and going back into your childhood and realizing uh, maybe some things weren't your fault or realizing that you were a good kid, you were a good child, you didn't deserve what happened to you, and you love that person and you nurture that person inside of you to heal the parts of the consciousness that have pathologies that are rooted back to childhood. When you can forgive others unconditionally in love and then forgive yourself, you can start to heal those parts of yourself little by little and dissolve and let go of the old and move into the new and upgrade your identity. And through that process of self-love, you can start to transform and evolve upward and to a fully conscious being, which allows you to be more conscious in your relationship and in your business and with your creator. So this is a, this is an upward spiral, but it's painful because sometimes you have to have a breakdown in order to have a breakthrough. These breakdowns are suffering. It's like enlightenment by the way of the cross. We suffer our way into enlightenment. That's why we're spiritual beings having a physical experience. That's the dichotomy is the dichotomy is we're spirit and we're flesh at the same time, right? So when you do the self-work, if you start to evolve faster than your partner, that'll cause um, uh, a polarization as well of suffering because now you're evolving at different rates. So it happens like this. So if you evolve away from your partner and you say you're trying to get, in cl uh, get closer to your partner and grow business and do all these things at once... You know, you could you could evolve away from each other. And you feel like oh, it's this thing's going to come to an end. But I I really believe that if if you feel you're meant to be with this person that you love so much, and and them same with you, right? Because that's a blessing. If you can make it through the tough times, then you'll come full circle and you'll come into matrimony, and be you know you might be unequally yoked for a while, but you might come into a beautiful place where you blossom together. Do you know what I'm saying? And this could take years. And this is why um, I think that being with one person can be so powerful that, that you love and, and building a life with and commitment, committing to your business, committing to your wife, committing to and having those constraints is so powerful because it allows everything that's not true, truth with a capital T, anything that's not true can has to dissolve and fall away right does this make sense so when you are in for the long term and you're in all the way until your death and you make decisions that put a stake in the ground that are rooted in your death they're rooted in you know what finishes your life you make certain decisions that never change no matter what they're musts. They're not should. They're shoulds. They're musts. When you when you make those committed decisions, now it reorganizes everything in your life to the neurons in your actual brain to your habit patterns. And if you look at some people that you really aspire to be like, like wow, how does that person operate like that? How do they do that? How do, how are they so conscious? It might be because they have made commitments and decisions in their life that are rooted in a place of purpose that affect all the micro decisions along the way. So when you know why you're doing something, then you're not applying short-term band-aids. These short-term quick fixes that are may maybe helping you selfishly in the short term, but they're just destroying your life and your relationships in the long term. Um, I'm going to wrap this up in a minute, but I want to talk about the the dark night of the soul. I believe that everybody has to go through a period in their life where they go through tremendous unmerciful suffering until they see the big picture. It could be a physical dis-ease. It could be a car accident. They could get sued. They could actually face their own death. They, they, could, they could die. <laughs> they could go through the loss of a business or bankruptcy or crisis or divorce or death in the family. Something that puts them through, like I said, unmerciful suffering to the point where, one, they're on their knees crying and they feel like they're never going to get out. That's number two. Is now they, It's uh, like stages of grief. They're 100% for sure now 
that they're never going to get out of this for the rest of their life. They know that this is the fate of their life. And the suffering is never going to end. I think it's only at that point where that, that type of trauma forces a change in your consciousness. That way, when you do get out of that thing, now you're into a place of gratitude. It's only when you're, because gratitude is the secret of success and everything because it's a very high vibration. It's a calibration of love, peace, tranquility, hope. Um, but the opposite of that is being ungrateful, feeling like your life sucks, you deserve um, your, your entitlement. Um, Shame. Shame is a really, really, shame is the lowest of the vibration. If you read uh, um, Dr. David Hawkins, Power Versus Force, he, he describes all this in that book. That's where I get this stuff from, and I really can see it or feel it. So sometimes you have to, like I said, let go and go through a period of suffering until you're willing to cut all that stuff, that you're carrying all that baggage to let it go and it feels like you're dying but i think of it like a beach ball if a beach ball is you're holding it underneath the water and you're fighting and you're you're holding this thing down right and you finally get so tired you let go the beach ball rises and pops up to the surface and then it just buoyantly floats because that's its natural state so what type of things we're holding down that's causing unnecessary suffering that we're actually broadcasting unto other people because you're equally as responsible for anything that's going in your going on in your life with your wife or your parents or your friends or anything that's happening. Once we accept full responsibility for what's happening that we don't, we, the things that we say we don't like, or until we accept full responsibility for it, it's never, ever going to change because we're not actually accepting and admitting the fact that we are the co-creators. We are co-creating every single thing that's happening. So next time you are um, in an uncomfortable uncomfor situation or a fight with your spouse over the same damn thing, look inside and say, how am I creating this right now? Because if it wasn't for you being there, it, it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't be happening right now, right? It's better. It's a lot easier to raise a healthy intimacy than it is to try to fix a broken one, right? There's an amazing book by Robin Williams called What Dreams... I mean, it's a story, a movie. Robin Williams was in a movie called What Dreams May Come. And he was willing to go to the depths of actual astral hell to find his wife, who he loved so much. He was willing to go to hell and be with her, right? And I think of things like that. I know that, um, I think it was Matthew, the tax collector said to Jesus, I believe in you, Jesus. You know, I want to, I want to learn from your teachings. I want, and, and in the Bible, Jesus said, then give up everything you have right now and follow me right now. And he was like, uh, I got to go. <laughs> like, are you willing to give up everything? Are you willing to give up everything that you hold so desperately and dearly onto? And I think that you'll have all those things when those things no longer matter. Any materialistic thing you've ever wanted. When you can finally let it go. If it's meant to be, it'll come back. And the last thing I'll say is, um, I think it was a couple years ago, my wife and I, we were stressed out. We went through this period where we just were not getting along. And it was this cycle. And I finally, I just, I, I went and I like shut off the TV and I just sat down on the couch and I was like, we need to talk. Like either we're for each other or we're against each other. And we keep making each other the enemy. We keep blaming each other for what we're going through. And we need to work this out and start building healthy habits and being for each other. And it was my friend, Joshua Latimer who he's has this whole family systems thing he's coming out with right now. But he was, uh, he was telling me about date night. I was on the phone with him and I was like, that's impossible. I'm working 80, 90 hours a week right now. I can't do date night with my wife. 
how am I going to, how am I going to shut off everything and just go on a date with her once a week, once a week? Are you crazy? So we tried it in the first date night. It was a Tuesday night and I was so angry with her. I was picking a fight with her and I, I was about to jump out of the car at a red light and I couldn't stop looking at my phone and I was about to go, go work more. I felt like, Oh my God, we're losing thousands of dollars. Everything is going to burn down. This is insane. And I was holding her responsible and blaming her for something that I had created, right? Um, because the immature, egotistical, selfish part of us that has been through pain and suffering the fast in the past feels like it's going to die. If you're not constantly working and working and working, you feel like everything is going to fall apart and it's going to be your fault anyways. <laughs> Everything is your fault. So you can get into this, this victim cycle. But the truth is, I'm not trying to thump Jesus, but he would, this dude was a genius. He says, look at the toy, the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Look at the birds. They're fed every day. They don't store up food, right? I literally give clients um, in my landscaping business property maintenance quotes to do their landscaping and they're living in a three quarter million dollar house and they got beautiful cars in the driveway and their house is decked out and the owner of the house is, is like in this anxiety where he can't stop working or she can't stop working to get more and 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 more. Like, and I'm sitting here like, dude, like these people are balling and they're storing up more and more and more because they feel like if they stop for a minute, that everything's going to fall apart and they're going to die. So, you know, I can really see that's not gratitude. That's not happiness. And I'm a victim. I mean, victim, wrong word. I am a, uh, what's word? I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of the same thing. We live in the most beautiful uh, place on earth. We're at a beautiful time. I think it's like 50% of all the food prop made in the United States is actually thrown away in the garbage. So it's a shift in our paradigm. It's a shift in our consciousness from that of lack and that of scarcity to that of abundance, to that of understanding that we are going to be okay. We're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And if you know that you're going to be okay and everything's going to be okay, you can slowly let go of those low vibrations of fear and you can come out of that and allow yourself to be present with well first of all your creator and with yourself get out of the cycles and stories that you're telling yourself in your head every day of what everything means and come back into your body come back into gratitude realize you're not you know three minutes from being eaten alive by a saber-toothed tiger that you are blessed you are okay your life is beautiful despite your circumstances. And when you change the way you see things, the things you see change. This is real physics. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Max Planck, when he was accepting the Nobel Prize and he got on stage and he said, in my life of studying the smallest particle known to man, which is the atom, I have come to believe that uh, studying matter, there is no matter as such. Because when you zoom down to the smallest subatomic particle with these microscopes, you realize there is no matter. All matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration. So that which is seen does not come from that which doth appear. Everything is energy. So when you allow yourself to let go of the low energies and vibrate to the higher energy, energy and realize that you are energy and you position yourself in a place of gratitude you change the way you see things the things you see must change like einstein said do we do we, you live in a friendly or hostile universe because if you believe you live in a hostile universe you're going to attract hostility into your marriage hostility in yourself hostility in your organs hostility in your body and your consciousness hostility with your clients and lack in everything you see and do. Your entire life will be you running on a treadmill, terrified in constant drama. You will attract drama, and you won't even see that the center of all of it is you. The eye of the storm is you. You're the one creating the love and peace and light in your life, or you're the one creating the hell that you live in all the way until your own physical death.
and causing suffering for the people that are around you. Causing, which moves us to causality. When you stop looking at the effects of everything and stop complaining about the effects, you start looking at the cause. Like Neo in the Matrix, you can start to see the cause. You have now have equity eyes. You have eyes of equity. You can see with equity eyes. Oh. Ah. You're beginning to see what's causing the issue. But first you have to see it in yourself. Oh, I'm the cause of this issue. Something happens. I perceive it as a negative. I cry. I whine and I complain. I get on the phone and I discharge that negativity into somebody else. I cry and complain. Now you're in a story of suffering. Now you're creating suffering. Do you know anybody who complains all the time about their life? And they're constantly complaining to you that they're getting in fights with everybody, including you. Because people are judging them and criticizing them and cutting them down and they just want to live their life and they're stuck in this drama cycle. It's because they're cycling the drama and they're living in drama and they're living in hell and they're complaining about it. I had a friend one time back in my earlier years. I used to get in fights with him. He's very wise. He was a very wise alcoholic. <laughs> he said to me, I used to get in fights with him because he'd always tell me how to live my life. And one time he said to me, he goes, Keith, if you don't want to get in a fight with me and you don't want me to tell you how to live your life, quit telling me your effing problems. Quit calling me and crying about your problems. Put on your big boy pants. You're a grown man now and quit crying about your problems. So it's the buck stops here. If something happens that you perceive as something that's uh, a very, very hard time, Ask yourself two questions. One is, do I sound like a flake who is in distress? Or do I sound like a man who knows how to handle himself? Because when you learn how to handle yourself and you learn how to ha handle problems, then the next, then something else happens. It's nothing has ever happened and this is that. That's a tough one. You might be able to say it while you're laying in bed and relaxing. Nothing has ever happened. And this is that. But in the real time, can you say it while you're in distress? So next time something happens that you perceive as very stressful, say nothing has ever happened and this is that. The thing that happened, it happened. So how am I going to fix it? Or I'm going to keep cycling it in my psychology and then bringing it home, you know, to my family and living in this hell story in my head. Nothing has ever happened. And this is that. It only exists as much as we keep dragging it along and creating it. Um, I think it was to no, no, no. Henry David Thoreau said, I uh, suffered a thousand deaths. You know, but only had one. So we suffer it a thousand times in our thoughts, but it only actually happened one time. A couple of weeks ago, I, I, I do window cleaning and I accidentally, me, I accidentally scratched. Uh, I'm pretty sure I did it. I don't know for a fact, but I, I presume that I scratched a customer's hardwood floor. Beautiful home, like a museum inside. I just put my soft um, Sherwin-Williams ladder on a beautiful hardwood floor with soft rubber bottoms. The bottom was clean. I turned the ladder around. It just dragged against the floor and it caused a scratch. And I looked down, I was like, that's impossible. How, how did that happen? I kneel down, I'm looking at it. And then the customer walks in and I'm like, Hey, I'm glad you're here. Look, <laughs> your floor scratched. It's a pretty stressful situation. I won't, I'll tell you the rest of the story in a different video later, but I'm hiring a furniture medic. So I'm going to pay several hundred dollars for somebody to come out out of goodwill. My responsibility, um, I'm not admitting that I did it because I don't know for a fact, but out of goodwill, hiring somebody to come out and fix that scratch uh, right in front of the customer 
and mend it and cure it, right? But at the time, you know, I was calling up everybody I knew, freaking out, thinking that I'm going to get in sued or have an insurance claim for a brand new $50,000 hardwood floor. I'm calling my attorney up. I'm calling everybody thinking that the worst case possible scenario. And I was experiencing some, some pretty tremendous suffering for about four days straight thinking, oh my God, I just bought a house. I've got all these bills right now. I've got all this stuff going on. And now I got to buy a $50,000 hardwood floor for a customer. <laughs> I was freaking out <laughs> because I called up my buddy, a uh, service industry coach, Matt Smith. And uh, he's got a million dollar service company. And he told me some stories that put me at ease in two seconds, man. So I think it'd be pretty cool when things happen. We can just come home and be present. I think that. A lot of successful people we aspire to be like have all the same dramas and scenarios and situations and family members who are on drugs and people passing away and just, you know, crazy stuff. But you would never know by looking at them because they're not broadcasting all that stuff. They become more solution oriented. So. All right, my friend, that's the end of this podcast. Thanks so much for hanging out with me, Louis. Benuelis, Belouis, Autumn Rose. What's up? Thank you. Alec Schultz Sports, Merrick Keck, Lisa Allen, Adam Gregory, Midnight Chevy, Mike the Guitar Man, Truth Sets You Free, Cody. Okay, guys. Hit the like button. Everybody hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Or you just hit it. Hit the subscribe button. Dog, hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Patrick, Mike L, Mustang Shelby. Okay, a couple quick uh, announcements. GIE Expo 2019 in Louisville, Kentucky. That's happening for sure this year. There's going to be another uh, after-party YouTube YouTube rally meetup if you're here. Um, I'm going to be there for sure. It's going to be awesome. I am, I've got some announcements about that, but I'll be talking about later. I'm trying to talk to them right now about me holding my own private class at the GIE. That'll be in the, in the future. I'm working that out right now, and it might be a yes. So I would be teaching a whole bunch of marketing tactics and things that I've learned about social media marketing and how to implement it into your service business. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is I have a brand new course that just came out called the Marketing ROI Course. It's at keithkelfus.com forward slash ROI. It's an entire compilation of the private recordings from my uh, live workshop of how to market and automate the sales and marketing inside of your service business. It's just like there's so much stuff to learn in there. I can't even talk about it right now. It's it's amazing. I'll put a link in the description below this video. And then the Marketing ROI Live event, September 6th and 7th in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I have something personal going on right now in my family that's causing, uh, that I don't want to talk about yet, but it's uh, stressful and it's very, very important. So I'm holding off uh, announcing the live event. Um, I'm... 90% sure it's going to happen this year. And that's where people fly out from all over the country. And uh, a lot of the top industry leaders in our industry that are just absolute rock stars uh, that have six and seven figure businesses, they will be flying out and teaching at a two day live event called the Marketing ROI. This is something that you don't want to miss. So I'll be talking about that in the future. And so for that, I have to go right now. I got a lot of important stuff to do and I know you do too, my friend. So I'll talk to you soon and be blessed and stay blessed. Later.